last week we talked, you know, this loving father. And this week we're going to talk about, as we continue the series, we're going to talk about um, this, you know, this unbelievable forgiveness that God has. Amen. Um, and uh, before we get started, I want to pray. And uh, so we finish up uh, doing the offering. And we're going to talk about imagining forgiveness. Amen. Father, this morning I just thank you uh, for, your, for this opportunity to, to gather here uh, and just uh, to be in your presence, God, to worship you. And Father, I prayed uh, this morning that um, as we gathered, that um, we came here for a reason, God, whether it's, whether it's to have healing, God, to rejoice, have restoration, whatever the case may be, God, that we would receive that this morning. And Father, I pray that you would hide me behind the cross. God, just use me as an instrument and a tool. I'm a vessel for you, Father. And Father, I pray for your anointing this morning. And uh, I ask God that uh, if there's anyone here that needs a touch from you, they wouldn't leave here today without that. I pray all these things in the strong and matchless name of Jesus. Amen. So, you know, forgiveness, it's, it's a topic that, you know, we talk about a lot because we need it a lot. Amen. I mean, it's, you know, it's something that we all often think we need and we struggle living it out, more importantly. Um, and Jesus knew that forgiveness uh, it was not easy either. Think about it. He grew up in a family where some of the, his own family members didn't believe who he was. Um, he lived uh, his adult life in a place where a lake was dividing line, the dividing line between you know, two people groups that really hated each other. Um, he was treated harshly by people who didn't really love him. And he was killed by the very people he actually came to save. So um, you know, Jesus understood this thing about forgiveness. Amen. Um, and Jesus knew that forgiveness was not easy. But Jesus also knew the power of forgiveness. Today we're going to look at a, a, the story in the book of Luke, chapter 15. It's a parable about the prodigal son, and it's all very familiar to most of us. Um, Jesus, you know, he often taught in parables to help explain God's heart and priorities. And this story in particular, in particular was about a son who desperately needed the power of forgiveness in his own life. Uh, in Luke chapter 15, verse 11, it begins with this. A man had two sons, the younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to, to divide his wealth between his sons. So the story, you know, it opens up with the younger son requesting his money now. You know, uh, he wanted to get, you know, his inheritance now. And, and, uh, and, and, you know, that's a pretty wild thing to ask, you know, an alive person for your money now. Um, and, and if you don't think it happens today, it does. Unfortunately, even in my own family, I have family members that, uh, that I saw that happen. It wasn't a prodigal son. It was actually prodigal daughters. And a very sad situation to watch take place. And, uh, um, and it was very hurtful. But in, in essence, what that's really like is that's like the son telling the... Because the, he's asking him to divide every, everything right now. And it's really like the, the, the son telling the father, I wish you were dead. That's really what it was like. You know, I just wish you were dead. And, and, and so, you know, we learn two things from that verse about the son. Number one, he's selfish. And, um, you know, he's just a selfish person. And, um, and number two, he wants independence. You know, and I thought about that selfish and independence. Um, I have an 18-year-old son right now. <laughs> and uh, and um, he's, he's, he is stepping out of the boat, man. I'm loving it, you know. And I'm like, and it's, you know, I know it was coming. I knew, I saw it coming. But, boy, it's tough because, you know, you know the day he turned 18, he says, I'm going to get a tattoo. I'm like, yeah, man, get you three or four of them. Go knock it out, you know. And I was like, have a good time. You know, you're going to you know, shine it up there. You know, it's all good. And. And, um, you know, but, it, you know, we're, we've all been that person, haven't we? I think about, you know, my son being that way. But, I mean, I remember when I was 18, you know, and I can remember being that same way. And, you know, I, did, I knew everything, by the way, too. And I, and, I, and I definitely wanted my independence. And I think a lot of us are that way. And, um, but we also learned something about the father, too. We learned that the father allows him to go. And, um, and I thought about that because rather than retaliate against the son's, you know, bad behavior, he just allows him to go. He allows them to, to go. And, and it's the free gift of God uh, for us to choose our way. Amen? Aren't you thankful that God allows us to choose our way? Um, that, we, that we have a loving Father that allows that. And, and you know, if, if we choose our own way, we have to accept responsibility for it as the son is going to find out. See, a few days later, this, this young son packed all his belongings and he moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money and his wild living. And then about that time, his money ran out. A great famine had swept over the entire land, and he began to starve. And some of us in this room have made our home in a distant land, haven't we? I mean, we've been that, that prodigal son, prodigal daughter, where we've you know, done foolish things and we're not very proud of, and, you know, and we get to this point in our life where we're just like you know, the story. We're, we're, you know, we're in a distant land, and we're living far from the truth, and we've made our home outside of God's will. 
And um, it's not a place to be. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a good place to be at all. And um, the son has gone to a foreign country, blown all his money, and found himself in trouble. He has nothing. Look what it says in verse 15. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. But no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, At home, even the hired servants had food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. So the son begins to realize that he doesn't have it all figured out. Uh, you know, and and um, he thought he had it figured out, but he didn't. And um, he thought that his father's home had handcuffed him, but now he realizes that what he thought was handcuffs was actually guardrails. Amen? And I mean, do you remember the time that you came to that point in your life when you realized that, it, you know, you were actually being protected? Um, boy, that's a humbling feeling. Amen? Where you realize, oh, Lord, I, you know, it wasn't a bad thing. It was actually a pretty good thing. And the father was actually looking out for him. He wasn't limiting him at all. And uh, the son begins working for a Gentile. This would be the equivalent of being in the, the most embarrassing, vulnerable, and needy place you could be in life. And I've been there. You know, I've been there before. And I think most of us in this room, if we've lived life long enough, we've been there. And we know what that feels like. And, you know, it's at that lowest place in the life where he has nothing to give and nothing to receive. He feels like he has nowhere to run. And he, and he realizes his dependence on his father was not weak. It actually was wise. And, um, and, and I think we all get to that point where we come to our senses. And if you haven't this morning, then I pray before you leave here that you will. Amen. In verse 18 through 24, it says this. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on, a hire, on as a hired servant. So he returned home to the father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, and he embraced him and kissed him. And, he said, and his son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet, and kill the calf we have been fattening. And we must celebrate with a feast. For the son of, uh, of mine, this son of mine, was dead, and, and now he has returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. And so the party <laughs> began. And, and, and you think about it. The son expected to receive what he deserved because of his sin. And, 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 and against his father, the text says that while he was still a long way off, the father saw him coming and ran towards him. And the father did not wait until the son got to him. He did not wait for the right speech, the right explanation, or the right time. The father ran to him. And um, there's power in that. You know, this is sometimes called the, the parable of the running father. And in a culture where senior figures were far too dignified to run anywhere, this man lifts his cloak and he barrels towards his son. Oh, as soon as he sees him, he runs towards him. He doesn't hesitate. And um, this is a good picture of the unconditional love of God, isn't it? I mean, you think about it. This is, this is, this is God you know, in, in the way that he embraces you and I when we make a mess of everything. And how many of you in this room have made a mess of something in your life? Amen? I mean, more than once, amen? I could, like, raise everything here. And, and I thought about, you know, every time, though, I've never once gone into a church service. I've never once got on my knees and prayed where God says, you know what? Not this time, Mike. It's never happened. It's never once happened where God says, no, you've, you've, you've gone too far. Man, I'm thankful for that. Because the world will do that, won't they? I mean, your friends will do that. You know, your family will do that. But God won't. And sometimes we get upset with God not making our family and our friends accept us the way he does. You know, but there's always repercussions for our sins, aren't there? You know, we have to understand there's repercussions. And I'm so thankful today, though, that when no one else will forgive me, that when no one else will, will stand up and say, you know what, Mike, it's okay, God will. And he, that same promise that he gives to me, he gives to all of us. And, and so we have to be able to, to run towards that. Even as God runs towards us, we should run towards that. And, 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 and think about that. You know, in that moment, his son doesn't smell good. He looks the worst he ever has. He has no money. He's homeless, and he's completely vulnerable. And, and, and surely the father would wait until he got cleaned up, right? Didn't. He didn't. He didn't wait. He, uh, you know, and, and, and he, didn't, he didn't do anything. The father ran to him in his ruin. And I, and I thought about that. He sees his response. The words of the father shows his heart and, and the priorities. This son was dead and is alive. He was lost and now he's found. Think about this. No matter how far you've turned from God, no matter you know, what you've gone through and no matter what state you're in, the father does not see your ruin. He sees your response. 
He sees the response. Think about this. His forgiveness is barreling towards you and I. And, and his love is embracing us. And he is celebrating that you and I have come home. And there's power in that. There's power in the fact that, that God does that. Because, you know, you think about it. There's not too many other people that will do that unconditionally over and over, over and over, and over and over. Um, as Jesus shared this story, he knew the power of God's forgiveness changes lives forever. It welcomes the, the once the one once living in a foreign land back into the family. No matter how far you've run, no matter what pit you are in, God wants to see you coming home. And I thought about this story. When I was about 18 years old, I, was, uh, I just went in the Marine Corps. and um, I, I went in the Marine Corps in July of 1989. And, and I got to come home for a, a Christmas and New Year's Eve break. And brought a few of my buddies home with me. And, and, and we got to, uh, um, uh, you know, we're going to have a big party, New Year's Eve party. And... I had wrecked my vehicle, a rental vehicle, and, and um, my uncle's business stood right beside where my house was. And part of that business was that he had lots of vehicles that his foreman used. And they were all gone on trips and whatnot. And it didn't dawn on me that, that they would come home that weekend. And all, I knew that all the keys to their vehicles was inside them because they had a big fence around them for insurance reasons. And so I, I, had, a need, I had a need of a vehicle. So I went over there and I opened the gate, got one of the vehicles, went uptown and Bought a bunch of booze and was coming back home. And when I turned the corner to come to the house, there was three sheriff's cars and, and, and one of the foreman sitting there. And it just so happened to be the foreman's car that I was driving. So instead of stopping, I had known that foreman since I was probably 10 or 11 years old. I ran. And, and I outran the law. And I went and hit the car. And that's called Grand Theft Auto, by the way, if you don't know what that's called. I was soon to find out. Now, now that Friday before this happened, um, uh, you know, my uncle had taken me out. My uncle held, had really played a big part of my life growing up. He's like a father to me. Um, I remember him and my aunt taking me out to eat and then telling me how proud they were of me. And, you know, they were just so, you know, so proud of what I had done, you know, going into the service and getting my life on track and making something of myself. And, and you know, and I just remember... Man, and, and, and now I'm running from the law from one of his employees, you know, uh, vehicles. And, 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 and I hit it, and, and, and I felt so bad, and, and, and no one, you know, I got away, I thought, but I, I couldn't get away from my consciousness. And so I ended up calling the sheriff's department. I said, hey, I know where that car is. I took him there, and, and, and they brought the, the foreman with him. Well, he had been in the sauce a little bit. If you know what me, being in the sauce a little bit means, he was been drinking a little bit. And he had me arrested for Grand Theft Auto. And so... Uh, I had to call my uncle the next day and tell him what had happened. And I'll never forget that feeling. I'll never forget having to call my uncle and say, I, I made a mess of this thing. I, I'm so sorry. And, and my uncle just was paused on the phone. And he said, son, I love you so much. He said, you know, it doesn't make a difference what you did. He goes, it's going to be okay. We'll get through this. And, um, you know, it's, 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 I'm not really proud of this moment. But, you know, I still love you. And I know things are going to be okay. And I just sat there, you know. They had just told me I was this big, strong, proud Marine. And I just sat there just boohooing like a little baby crying. You know, I'm sobbing on the phone saying, Uncle Gene, I'm just, I'm so thankful for you. And so thankful for you loving me. And, you know, and, and what, a, what an image of forgiveness. There's power in that. Amen. I mean, he could have been so ugly to me. He could have been so mean to me. But he didn't, he wasn't mean at all to me. Now, his foreman was. <laughs> but he wasn't, you know. You know that was the picture of God. That was the picture of the world. Amen. So uh, that's what was happening to me. And I thought about this parable that we read. But you know, the story really doesn't end there, does it? Because we, you know, the story continues on. Listen to what Jesus says here. Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working, and when he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house, and he asked one of the servants, "Hey, what was going on?" Uh, uh, and he says, "Your brother's back," and, and he was told. And your father has killed a fattened calf, and we are celebrating because of his safety. And the older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him, but he replied, All these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to do. And in all that time you never gave me even one of young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf? My, his father said to him, look, dear son, you have always stayed by me and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he's found. And the older brother was angry, 
that his younger brother was receiving a celebration when he had worked for and earned his inheritance his whole life. And um, he was angry that grace was extended in, in this situation. And he didn't think it was very fair at all, did he? Um, his heart was not for the loss, but was for his own well-being. Um, it's a lot like his brother was, but just in a different way, right? He was still being selfish. And, and, and you think about the younger brother's sin was not what distinguished him from the elder brother. As the elder brother thought, it was his repentance. See, that's what distinguished the younger brother. It was that he repented. The younger son realized his need for the father and changed his ways completely. The father's response was to throw a party and restore him completely to the family. You cannot have restoration without repentance. Think about that. You're never going to be restored in your life or anything that's going on that you've ever done, either then, later in the past, or right now in your present. You're not going to have any type of restoration until you have repentance. It just can't happen. Now, I wish it would. I wish it could, but it's not. You know, there's no, I'm not going to sprinkle some Jesus dust on you. It's going to make it happen. You've got to be able to repent. You've got to be able to say, God, I'm sorry. Forgive me of this thing that I'm doing. Amen? And then you've got to walk away from it. That's the hard part, isn't it? It's the walking away from. And the Father's forgiveness, it, it will restore us. It restored the young brother and the young son, but it also will restore you and I as well. So the, the son could have, he could never have imagined, you know, the way the father would lavish his love on him. But the older brother couldn't understand why he did it at all. You know, what's up with you, pops? What you doing, man? <laughs> Are you playing with me? You know, you've never done anything for me like this, and I've been faithful to you this whole time. You know, that's how he was feeling. And, you know, and, and some of us probably in this room are not the younger brother, but the older brother. Think about that. Some of us have done things right. We were raised with good morals and ethics. We've grown up in the church, and we never strayed. But did you notice what the older brother chose to do when he found out his younger brother had repented? The text says the older brother became angry and wouldn't even go in. Wouldn't even go in. I mean, you know, I hear this often said that, that angels rejoice when someone gives their life to the Lord. Amen? You know, the Bible actually says that saints rejoice. The Bible actually says that you and I rejoice. Amen? And, 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 and that's what we're supposed to do when we're born again. When we're children of God, no matter what someone's gone through, no matter what someone's done, no matter what's happened, we ought to be able to do that. That means here in a church, when you know about somebody else's business, Right? And you know that someone's made a mistake, you ought to welcome them back in with open arms. But Brother Mike, you don't understand. They hurt me. Hey, I understand. I could tell you story after story. Amen? But that's, that's the response of the Father. And we're to respond like the Father. But so often we respond like the older brother. The older brother was passive. He's stuck in legalism. He didn't even try to understand the Father's heart. But immediately critiqued his younger brother. And I'm gonna, I want to give you three signs that we might be like the older brother in this parable. Number one, you question when someone repents. You say something like, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see what happens. Time will tell. Number two, you would rather critique than celebrate. You would rather find the fault than celebrate. You would rather find a reason not to celebrate than a reason to celebrate. And number three, you don't try to understand the Father's heart for another person. You don't put yourself in the position of the Father to understand. You don't understand that. And listen to what it says in Matthew chapter 6. If you forgive others the wrongs that have done to you, um, your Father in heaven will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive the wrongs you have done. See, forgiveness is not just for us. When we receive the forgiveness of God, we, we are commanded to extend that same forgiveness to others. Amen? Amen? That's, 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 yeah, I got to hear an amen on this one. Amen? Yeah. Yeah, because that's the hard part, isn't it? You know, we all want to be forgiven, but it's so hard to extend forgiveness. It's difficult to extend forgiveness. You see, in 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 5, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. All this is from God. You know, and it says, Who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. Amen. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. That means if you need forgiveness, I'm here today to tell you this, that the Father is running towards you with his arms wide open as well. Think about that. Forgiveness is yours for the taking. And if you need to extend forgiveness, I'm here today to tell you that the power of forgiveness does not come from your own strength, but from the Christ that's inside you. Amen. 
See, on our own, we don't have the power to forgive. I got news for you. You don't. And if you think you do, something's going to happen in a, in, a, in a moment in your life where you're not. Somebody's going to hurt your family. Someone's going to hurt you at work. Someone's going to hurt you somewhere. Someone's, you know, you're going to have a pain that no one else can touch. And listen, only the power of God, only the, only the Spirit of Christ living inside you is going to allow you to overcome that. Amen? You know, and, and when I see people walking around bitter and carrying things, I'm like, listen, listen, listen. Let Jesus work on that inside you. Let Jesus work on that inside you. When someone hurts you and you know you've been hurt, anybody ever been church hurt before? Anybody ever been church hurt before? Man, church hurt's bad, isn't it? It's like, you know, it's like family hurt, man. Church hurt, because it's the same thing, isn't it? You know, once you really get close to people in church, it's like being close to someone in your family. And when you get hurt in your family, it hurts. But it hurts in church, too. You know, the difference is in church, you can go to another church. <laughs> but you can't go to another family, can you? In this day and age, you can. This day and age, people are leaving families all the time. They just walk away from mamas and dads. They walk away from sons and daughters. And God says, run to them. No matter what they've done, run to them. But you don't understand, Brother Mike. You don't understand what they did. I don't. You're right. You're right. I don't understand. But God does. Amen. The Bible says that greater is he that's inside me than he's inside this world, right? So, so what's inside you is more powerful than what's inside this world. And if what's inside you is more powerful, then it's, it's able to overcome anything that you've ever gone through, anything that you've ever experienced, anything that you've ever, you will experience. But I'm like, you don't understand. I don't. Here's the big idea, though. Let me give you the big idea today. Forgiveness is the fuel of a heart driven by Christ. Forgiveness is the fuel of a heart driven by Christ. I'll never forget I've told you the story of so many times of me and my father. My father and I had a horrible relationship. You know, number one, he was bipolar schizophrenic. So he was very abusive and very mean. Um, you know, when the first time I ever met him, he was at the state mental hospital in Chattahoochee, Florida. You know, it was a very tough situation. Um, and, and so the only interaction we ever had was there was really never any good times at all. And so my grandparents got me a 10, raised me, and I went to the Marine Corps. And then I was with Lori one night, and I'll never forget... Um, I was sitting there, and the phone rang. It's about 10 o'clock at night. And my father called me, you know. And, and now I had, had a job with an oil company. I was making good money. And, and I thought, you know, you know, what in the world? And he calls me, and he says, hey, listen, uh, I just wanted to call you and tell you that um, I was proud of you and uh, wanted to see if we could get together. And I said, listen to me. I said, make sure you, you I said, where are you at? And he said, I'm, I'm, I'm here in Lakeland. I said, just, are you sitting down? He goes, yeah. I said, all right, listen to what I'm about to tell you. He says, what's that? I said, don't you ever call me again. I said, you ever call me again? I said, I hate you. I've never liked you. I said, I never will like you. And I don't want you to ever be a part of my life. I said, don't you think you can start walking in my life now that you've ever, you know, and I'm a grown person. I said, so just, just think that I'm a dead person to you. Leave me alone and stay out of my life. I said, I don't ever talk to you again. I said, if you do, I'll kill you. And I hung the phone up on him. Never talked to me again. Never called me again. My first son, my son was born. He asked to come through so he could, you know, maybe come by and see. And I said, that's fine. I said, I'll, I, you can come through, but you can't. You know, I don't want you staying at my house clean or anything like that. Next time I, I saw him after that uh, was in a casket. I wasn't saved at any point in this time in my life. I, you know, I knew about the Lord, but I wasn't saved. And I'll never forget my, my father's laying there, and I went in there. And the only reason I went to the funeral is because my sister, my, my, aunt, uh, my aunt Rita, and we were sitting there, and kind of noticed we looked like each other a little bit, but ah, whatever, and I didn't cry, I mean, I, I, I didn't, I wouldn't, nothing was emotional for me at all, it was nothing at all. Two years later, I gave my life to the Lord, I'll never forget the first thing the enemy did with me, he goes, man, look at what you and God are doing, man, you, 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 you're, you're born again, that's awesome, he goes, how about you and your dad? I'm like, wow, and, and so to make this story really powerful, I went to this thing called Trace D's, I gave my life to the Lord, and on that weekend, and, 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 and this, this man I met, he calls me like three days later, and he goes, Mike, can I get you to come to my house? I want you to listen to this CD. And I said, why? He goes, I want you to listen to it because I think uh, it, it speak to you. He goes, God woke me up at 3 o'clock this morning to tell you to come to the house. And at 3 o'clock that morning, I'd woke up and couldn't sleep. And I was like, okay, that's weird. So I went. 
And I felt really weird because he lived way out in the middle of nowhere. And he's kind of a weird person. He's just different, you know. You know, people that are different, you know, he's a little weird. So I was like, yeah, it's kind of weird, you know. And, and I went, and I was like, he wants me to listen to a CD. I mean, it was kind of strange to me. And I said, I went. You know, we're sitting there, and he's, he's a big man, you know. And he, and he just kind of looks at you a little bit, you know. He doesn't talk a lot, and I talk a lot. And, and I'm sitting there, and we're listening to it. And, it, and, it, and it's a story of this famous composer that was a perfectionist. And he tells the story of why he was a perfectionist all his life. And, and, and in this moment, he says that, that as he was growing up, that, that, that his father, would, would, as a child, would come home drunk and would beat on him and tell him that he was worthless and he was sorry and he was no good and that he wished he was dead. And he says, you know, you're, you're no good at anything and you never will be. And he says, so I spent the rest of my life trying to be the best at everything I could. And so when I became this famous composer, he goes, it was just, um, uh, you know, I, I never really felt like I had ever really belonged to it because I still was trying to earn my father's love. And he says, you know, and, and so, and, and, and I don't know how to tell you this, but in this story, I began to imagine my father. And, and, and somehow, some way, God took this moment to show me that what had happened to my father all his life had kind of happened to me that we had both been told that we were going to be no good and sorry and worthless by our grandparents, that they didn't mean anything by it. It was kind of like backwards, you know, reverse psychology, I guess. I don't know what you would call it. But she didn't mean anything by it, but I guess he believed it. And then I found out that he had said that to every, she had said that to every one of her, her, her grandkids, her kids and her grandkids. And see, because none of those kids were hers, she had adopted all of them within the family. It's a long story, but here's what happened. In that moment, I began to see what had happened. And why his life took the path that it took. And God just showed me. And I said, and, I, and all of a sudden, my, dad, my dad's been gone for two years. The enemy's using it against me. And I just was able to forgive my father. Man. And there was like, I was sitting there with Ken. And I said, um, this is, man. I said, Ken, I, I wish he was here. And he said, why? I said, because now I don't understand why he was going what he, through what he went through. And I said, I wish I could go back and tell him I'm sorry. And I said, he goes, Mike, you can. And I said, how? And he goes, just use me. And I said, what does that look like? He said, I'll just stand up. And he goes, you talk to me. And I said, Dad, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say those things to you. And if you'll forgive me, I'll be so much better. And he said, and he just... Ken just stood there and he, and he just wrapped me in his arms and he told me he loved me. And the forgiveness that, 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 that I needed to give, even after he was gone, was able to be given. And there was such a peace between me and my father at that moment. I can't really explain it to you. It was very supernatural to me. But at that moment, everything was over. Everything was through. I was at peace. And I wonder this morning, you know, this power of forgiveness. Can you imagine that kind of forgiveness? See, I think today more than ever, there are people coming to church and they, they either need to extend for forgiveness or they need to receive forgiveness. I know for me in those two instances, those two stories I told you about my uncle and then my father, they were, they were very powerful moments in my life. You know, maybe you're here this morning and, and, and you need this forgiveness in your life. Maybe you need the same type of forgiveness from someone that's even moved on, that's, that's passed on. Maybe it's someone that's sitting right beside you. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe you just need to tell them that you're sorry. Maybe you need to be the first one, the one that's bold enough to say, you know what, I made a mistake, I'm sorry. Lori and I have been going through some things over the last few months. We've been having to humble ourselves, tell each other that we're sorry a lot. Husbands and wives, can you, can you understand that a little bit? Can you understand having to do that? And we'll have those good days, and then we'll have that one real bad day. You know what I'm talking about? You know, and it's that one bad day we have to just say, you know, who's going to be the first to say I'm sorry? Who's going to be the first to go seek the forgiveness? And I'll be honest with you, sometimes I'm not that first one. Sometimes I'm the last one. I shouldn't be that way. Brother Mike, what are you saying? I'm saying I'm human. <laughs> and I mean, if I'm human, that means you're human too, right? Let's pray. Father, this morning, I think there are people here in this room right now. Father, I know there's probably people in this room right now. 
that need to extend or receive forgiveness. You know, when I imagine forgiveness, I imagine those two stories in my life. And I imagine there's people right now that are thinking of stories going on or, or a situation right now in their own life where forgiveness needs to be extended or received. You know, if that's you this morning with, with every head bowed, I just want you to just raise your hand. Say, I'm right here, Pastor Mike. I need, to, I, I, I need this forgiveness in my life. I feel like things aren't just going to be any better until it happens. But Pastor Mike, I don't know how it works. I don't know what it looks like. You can, break, you can, you can put your hands down. Here's what I want to say to you this morning. I want to say this to you. It looks like, and it begins with you accepting Christ into your life in a, in, a, in a way that's more powerful than you already have. And what I mean by that is it means walking in the power of forgiveness. Just like the father, the parable of the father running to the son, some of us have to be the father running to those that need forgiveness. We need to be able to extend that same type of loving, un, uh, uh, unconscionable forgiveness. And at the same time, some of us need to be the son, the daughter. We need to recognize the father's right there waiting for us. He's been there the whole time. <laughs> and all we have to do is receive it. All we have to do is receive it. God will send a miracle your way. God can bring healing to a situation that you've been walking in for years. For almost 33 years, I walked around hurting over a situation with my father. And God says, I've been here the whole time.